Welcome to the Press One for Nick podcast. My name is Nick Glimsdahl, and my guest this week is Peter Fader. He is a professor of marketing at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. His expertise centers around the analysis of behavioral data to understand the forecast customer shopping and purchasing activities. He works with firms from a wide range of industries, and he is the author of Customer Centricity, focused on the right customers for strategic advantage, and co-author with Sarah Toms of the book Customer Centricity Playbook. Most recently, he co-authored Customer-Based Audit with Bruce Hardy and Michael Ross, which we'll be talking about today. Peter, welcome back to the Press One for Nick podcast. Uh, wonderful to talk with you, Nick. Really appreciate the chance to do so. You bet. So uh, one question I ask you at the very beginning, and I ask every single guest, is what's one thing people might not know about you? Well, uh, I have the world's greatest collection of dollar bills with interesting serial numbers. Okay, so um, what's I, the most interesting serial number of those interesting serial numbers? Uh, well, you'd have to go to coolnumbers.com, literally okay. a website that I, I set up years ago. It's, it's, it's old, it's awful, but, uh, and you look at the Hall of Fame and you'll see the, the, the best bills, not only from my collection, but there's a lot of people around the world with too much time on their hands and they check dollar bills and they send them in and uh, and yet yeah, that there's, there's some, some interesting ones there. There's a whole market for this people who buy and sell dollar bills with, with good numbers. Uh, I don't do that. I just collect them, but, um, it's just nice to tap into the cultural zeitgeist of something that has no reason to exist. <laughs> so if you are interested or you have more time on your hands, then, uh, go to, go to the website. And uh, it sounds, sounds very interesting. I'll have to at least check it out too. You really sold the website though. This, yeah. you know, this, this really awful website that needs updated. It is uh, awful, but yeah, but I'm thinking, and if any of, of the listeners have uh, too much time on their hands, mobile app, cool ooh. numbers, mobile app, that, that, that's my, my new year's resolution, my aspiration. Um, yeah. Mm. There it is. There it is. And just <laughs> scan it. That's right. Uh, I like it. All right. So the main reasons why we're here is not to talk about dollar bills, uh, but to talk about uh, the customer-based audit, that book that you created, the first step on the journey to customer centricity. And, um, you know, before the first question that I kind of have is, what is a customer-based audit? You know, somebody who looks at the book and they're in the airport or they're at the online and they're like, customer-based audit, huh? Well, I know what a customer is and I know what an audit is, but maybe give us the synopsis of what a customer-based audit is. Uh, sure. Well, if you know what an audit is, then then you're in pretty good shape. It's uh, it's just kind of a just a a, a regular, very standardized, uh, you know, ass assessment review that that you do. Uh, and uh, you know, on the financial side, we all understand that, and some we often dread that. But it's an important step to take, and if you're doing it right, not not only in terms of the the outcomes, but even the process itself. Uh, can be really in, insightful and, and valuable. And the problem is companies don't do that with their customer base. They're, they're, they tend not to analyze the customer systematically if they analyze them at all. They're busy looking at the products and they're thinking about the stores and maybe the employees and all sorts of other things. Well, why not be as systematic, as kind of regular and standardized about uh, about the customer base? Even if we're not launching a new product or there's there's not some kind of catastrophe brewing, uh, let's just step back. Let's look over our customers. Let's understand how they differ from each other, how they're changing over time, uh, what that all means, and, and what kinds of actions we should take on it. That is the customer base audit. So what is the main reason, or maybe there's multiple reasons, why people are so focused on the product or service, not necessarily the people that are buying the product or service? It's interesting. So it's a, a couple of reasons. One is it, it's just in terms of, uh, of kind of mind space that we can, we, we, we work with the product, we develop the product, we distribute the product, the product is just front and center of everything we do. And so it's not surprising that we obsess over anything related to the product or the service, of course. Uh, whereas until recently, the customers were much less visible, tangible, measurable. Uh, we would just, we'd create the product or service, we'd put it out there in the ether, and then money would show up. Um, but now we can start to see a tag and track and understand the customers at a level that's actually in many ways equal to the, the kind of tangibility of the product. Uh, the, but the problem is besides the tangibility factor, there's the tradition factor that, that companies have 
uh, have, have been created, organized, incentivized around the product and the processes associated with it. And while a company might have a chief customer officer, uh, it's not nearly as uh, uh, the, the, that role or, or, or customer activities in general are just a tiny little niche that often is is you know, given to someone in marketing. Deal with that customer stuff but while we deal with you know the business. Uh, and of course, you have no business without customers. And so we just want to elevate the, the, the visibility, the accountability, the importance, uh, the fact that the products that we sell are just a means to an end. It's, it's really understanding the customers who we sell them to and learn from uh, that, that really drives the, the, the health and the future of the business. So if I was a mid, mid-market to enterprise uh, uh, level organization, how often do I run a customer-based audit or is it a continuous and ever-evolving audit? Well, well, the answer is both, uh, but uh, so you should be running it, uh, you know, figure out what the right cadence is. In the book where we're looking at a, a, a fairly uh, typical retailer, uh, where at least the, 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 the time basis that we use in the book is quarterly. And I think for a lot of companies, that would make sense. But if you're in a, in a much higher cadence business where you're just selling stuff to, to particular customers like every week, then you know, maybe bring it down to a month. Or if you're selling mattresses, then maybe move it up to a year. So the, the exact uh, periodicity doesn't really matter that much, but you should pick one that just lines up well with just the way that you make decisions and kind of allocate funding across the business. Mm. So it's always interesting when it comes to customers' behavior, because some customers will say, even in a survey, a face-to-face, uh, at the checkout, um, et cetera, is, I want this. I want this product or service to do X, Y, Z, or I plan to do these five things in 2023. But what they say versus what they do sometimes is different. Why? Why is that? Amen to that, Nick. It's so important, and and all we care about in the the customer base audit is just uh, is just behavior, is just transactions. Who bought what when, and then understanding all the the patterns associated with it. Uh, I'm really interested in all that other stuff. What people say, how people feel, uh, you know, what 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 how their heart races when they see the logo, how they interact with other people, um, what's going on inside their brain. I'm interested in all that cool, new, emerging, sciencey stuff, but a lot of that stuff is going to be level two or phase two. Let's first understand the behavior. Again, let's understand uh, how many customers are, are really locked in and how many are just occasional. Let's understand how those customers are changing over time and then bring in all of that other stuff to, to understand the why part. There's not really a ton of why in the audit. It's more just about the kind of what and how uh, and I think that is the natural starting point. That's not to diminish the importance of, of, of the why, uh, but, but let's start with just who, but, what, when. Uh, really, really understand that. Walk before we can run and then dive deeper. Mm, I like that. So if a company was saying, man, I need to really, I like where this this episode's going. How do I find a way to analyze that customer ha- behavior? What's What's next? Right. Uh, and so, well, well first, we, we do the audit. Uh, and of course, we're happy to, to dive into the details of that. Uh, very often from the audit, uh, the some of the uh, the insights and the actions emerge immediately. It's just just really, really clear that as, as one example, something I've gone on and on about, and, and the book shows it again, those customers uh, who we acquire uh, in, in Q4, especially around the holidays, tend to be quite different from and often worse than the customers who acquired other times a year. So right away, boom, there, there's an insight. Let's uh, be careful about those customers we acquire, you know, associated with, with Black Friday and so on. And there'll be just a lot of other things that just uh, emerge. They kind of just hit you in the face when you start looking at the data the right way. Others that require a little bit more thought, maybe some, some deeper analysis, maybe some internal conversations about why these things are taking place. And that's why we do the audit, to spark those kinds of conversations, to ask those kinds of questions, once again, to do them regularly instead of when there's just, uh, instead of when the need arises. Hmm. So it's not just, there's so many other factors instead of just saying, this customer feels like this, so they're going to act like that. I feel, I feel like, 
Uh, I'm, I'm talking about my feelings over here, but I feel like the customer ba base or behavior is consistently evolving as is the customer's expectation. Um, from your perspective, how has that customer behavior evolved? Amazing uh, of how little it's changed. Uh, and of course, the, the, at the top of my mind, and perhaps uh, yours too, is COVID. Uh, and early on, people are saying this changes everything. People will mm -hmm. never shop the same way again, whether it's online, offline. Well, I, I don't need to go through all that. Uh, I, I went out on a limb uh, back there in March of two, uh, 2020 saying, uh, yeah, we're going to go through a rough ride here. But then behavior is going to more or less come back to where it was in 2019. And to a large extent, that's exactly what we're seeing, which is to say customers differ from each other. 80-20 uh, rules continue to apply. So a few of our customers bring in an incredible amount of value. Uh, th that basic ratio hasn't changed much. Customers, uh, even at a, at, a, at a granular level, tend to evolve over time, usually getting worse. You slow down your purchasing and eventually drop out. So a lot of the, the kind of generic patterns that I've been observing for, for decades before COVID, uh, we're, we're right back to them. Uh, and again, uh, rather than just taking my word for it, try it out yourself, do a customer base audit, and you'll see that those cohorts of customers that you've been acquiring recently are fairly similar to the ones you were acquiring uh, you know, two, three years ago. Uh, and that's, that, that tells you a lot about what you need to, to do, both in terms of customer behavior, but as well as supply chain and, and, and hiring and training. And uh, you, you don't need to, to change the playbook nearly as much as you might think. Yeah, it was a bold statement in, in March of 2020 to make that claim because everybody and their mother was saying, the world is going to change and everybody's going to, it's going to be absolutely chaos moving forward and the customer behavior is has changed dra dramatically and so you stepping out and and making that claim is is pretty bold and i think it's come to to fruition that that is that is true so kudos to you on on uh making that claim a broken clock is still right twice a day and i'm <laughs> wrong about a lot of things but uh this this was this was a good one and an important one I like it. Uh, so we talked about the framework a little bit at the beginning, you know, maybe help my listeners understand that framework of to to audit that customer base. So the a lot of the analyses that we propose in the book aren't new. There's actually very little that's, that's new in the book outside of the framework that we use to connect these analyses together. So the, the, the main body of the book is about the five different lenses that you should use to, to view your customers. And I know we're not going to get into all the details right now, mm -hmm. but just to give people a, a, a basic picture of it, imagine all of your customer data as, a, as an Excel spreadsheet. In fact, for many companies, that's exactly what they're using, where the rows are the customers and the columns are, are time. Again, it could be uh, weekly, monthly, quarterly. How many purchases did this customer make in that period of time? That's kind of the core data structure. And first, th that alone is, is kind of interesting. And I want uh, listeners to be comfortable with that and to, and to be doing that sort of thing. But then once we have that spreadsheet, how do we slice and dice it? So very briefly, lens one would be, let's take a vertical slice. Let's look across the customers in a given period of time. So uh, uh, just a histogram of how many purchases people made. Bunch of people will buy from us maybe one time in a quarter, but then there'll be this small group of people who are buying from us, say, 10 or 12 times. Let's understand what that distribution looks like, and then let's break it down to say, uh, how often are they buying? Uh, how many uh, different products are they buying? How much are they spending when they do? So let's start to, to decompose the behavior to start to get towards some of that why stuff. That's lens one. It's a natural starting point. Very briefly, lens two would be, let's do that for two vertical slices. So let's compare this period to last period. Think about what a lot of, say, retailers look at would be same store sales. Again, especially during the holidays. So period over period, what's changing? Uh, and again, decomposing that into how many customers are active and how often they're buying, how much they're spending. And then we start taking horizontal slices. So let's take a, a chunk of customers acquired at a given point in time, a cohort, and see what are they doing over time? So how is their collective purchasing evolving, often slowing down? That's lens three. That's my favorite. Lens four would be let's compare one cohort to another. And then lens five is let's bring 
all of it together, the vertical and horizontal slices to get a complete but systematic look at the entire customer base. That's a, that's a whole lot of detail. Uh, if if somebody, and I, I think it's it's what organizations should be doing, but they're saying, you know, just trying to think of the, the company, I don't have time for that, which is always uh, what time, what do you have time for? Because if you're not focusing on the customers and you should, then somebody else might be. Um, but what is there a top one that you would want to start with? Or is number one, the first one that you should be aligning with? Yeah, so it depends on the company, it depends on their own uh, data and analytics sophistication. So for, so for, for newbies, uh, indeed, lens one would make sense. Let's just take that vertical slice. Let's just look at that histogram and say, and, and, th and think about the 80-20 rule. Try to actually, mm -hmm. instead of just talking about it, to ask yourself, is purchasing as concentrated as 80-20 or is it maybe a little bit more evenly spread out? So so very, very basic. Uh, and, and again, there's a lot of companies, even some sophisticated companies don't know the answer to that question. Uh, as I said before, my own personal favorite would be Lens 3, the cohort. Let's look at a group of customers acquired a given slice in time. Uh, let's see how they're evolving. And this is really important because I've said it a couple of times now, group of customers who we acquired, let's say in Q1 2018, they are going to collectively tend to slow down. That Some of them are going to drop out. They're going to uh, buy from us less frequently. They're going to spend a little bit less when they do. And for a lot of companies, this is a very unpleasant surprise because they, they start taking it personally. What are we doing wrong? How have we failed our customers? You know, uh, and it's important to understand that pattern, that that's, it's, it's kind of a law of gravity in a way. You should come to expect it. And if you're not seeing the slowdown, that's pretty remarkable. You're doing something super well. So I think a, a lot of the problems that companies are trying to solve aren't problems at all, that they're just kind of laws of nature, but they just haven't been exposed to them yet. And I think the data is there. It's just doing the right, asking the right questions and doing the right in the audit to identify what are the things that they're doing right or what are the customers that we want to keep and or grow and ones that are maybe not not profitable or the ones that we want to focus on or or keep at all. So um, let me say two things to that, mm -hmm. Nick. So first of all, everything you just said there, that's book number one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's customer centricity focus on the right customers for strategic advantage which you and i have discussed before mm -hmm. uh, uh and the, absolutely right but before we get to that before you uh, you know read book one or or as you read book one you should be skeptical and you should say how do i know that this applies to my customer base how do i know that there are those focal customers that are, that are doing more and worth more that's why and you, you said it before, the subtitle of the new book is The First Step on the Journey to Customer Centricity. So let's just go into it, just, just not even thinking about the, the, the so what and the why and so on. Let's just, just look at the data and just see what the patterns are. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then, of course, start to think about it. Uh, and, and it can be quite remarkable to do that. Now, as you said, people don't want to. It, it's going to take some work. It's going to take not only analytical skills, actually the analyses are pretty simple, but but organizing the data and just having the discipline to make the time to do it. Uh, and and ironically, that's not hard, but, it's, but companies just push it off. And that takes us back to the idea of the audit. Look, no one would do their traditional financial audit if they didn't have to. Now, now no... Uh, you know, regulatory body is going to come in and hold a gun to your head and say, you know, you must do the customer base audit. Kind of wish they would. Yeah. Uh, but it's a matter of discipline. It's a matter of the C-level people saying, we need to carve out time to do this. We need to have the resources. We, we need to do it regularly and then to do it in not just in a check the box way, but what are we going to learn from it? And in many ways, that's the, that's the hardest part of all is, is making the time and having the discipline. Yeah, it's always it's always tough for a CX leader to have sometimes to have those conversations on up to that C-suite and saying, well, that's great, but we already do an audit. That's great, but we're already focused on the customer experience. And look at our CSATs, look at our customer effort score, look at our NPS score. So what, what nuggets, what paragraph should that point of contact and customer experience or wherever department that they're in, customer excellence, 
and they're bringing that that 30 minute conversation which we don't have another 30 minutes to talk about what what nuggets should they be approaching the c-suite saying this customer audit should be non-negotiable and should be done in parallel with the financial audit so i want to be careful about being critical about the folks doing cx work and, and cset work um uh, in fact i think there's just a, a wonderful uh hand in hand way that that those kinds of say, um, attitudinal measurements uh, layer on top of these kind of boring behavioral measurements. Uh, but one of the issues with the measurement there is that, first of all, we could say, here's the CSAT score. Uh, and very often, we're not looking at how it varies across the customers. You know, how many, and this kind of gets us to the thing we all love to hate, net promoter score. Mm -hmm. um, so instead of just saying, what's the net promoter score? Tell me how many promoters there are. Tell me how many detractors there are. That starts to paint out that, that picture of the histogram. And then again, instead of just telling me how NPS has changed from one period to the next, tell me how the, the number of promoters has changed. So as, as our NPS is going up from, from one period to another, uh, is it because we have more promoters or fewer detractors? And, and so let's start to just do uh, some of the things that we'll do kind of casually, a little bit more carefully and a little bit more regularly. So I think there, there can be a, a great fit between those approaches, uh, but I think it's, it's having this kind of audit mentality uh, to, to drive a, a, a lot of those conversations. Sure. So, you know, it kind of brings me up to the C-suite again is the they're all looking at performance and profitability. They're looking at how do I keep these, the people who pay my bills that that are that are giving me my bonus and that are keeping me employed happy as well. So why is it important to look at your performance and profitability through the lens of the customer? I can't believe it took us so long to get to that super <laughs> important question. Uh, so uh, as, as I suspect you know, and others might, uh, I've been doing this customer value stuff forever. Uh, but it wasn't until recently when I took the pivot exactly in the direction you just described, customer-based corporate valuation, that if we can show the folks in the C-suite and, and in finance and our external stakeholders uh, the, the value of the company through the customers, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to create wonderful alignment within the company. It's actually going to give us just a better understanding of what the company's worth uh, and better connection to the kinds of actions we should take. So my, my new company, Theta, that's exactly what we do. We're going to calculate customer lifetime value. And the main so what is, so what is this company or this business unit or this segment of customers worth? And again, uh, to translate into financial terms. But once again, first steps, before we start forecasting customer lifetime value, before we do any kinds of modeling at all, let's just look at the data that we have. Let's just look at just what's sitting there in that spreadsheet or that CRM system, just to look at the patterns, understand the differences, look at some of the trends. And once we do that, once we see some of the, the, the regularity of the patterns, then it begs the question, what's going to happen next? And then we start to model the data and forecast the data, lifetime value, corporate valuation. Uh, so this would be the natural starting point. It really should be the folks in finance and accounting who are demanding this kind of thing in order to see the kind of ROI that they're getting on products they're developing, on CX campaigns, on, 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 on new customer service initiatives. So, so this is kind of the, the, the bedrock baseline upon which everything else rests. Yeah, I think that what you just said is so important. There's so many, again, you, you don't want to poke, poke the CX bear or the CX employee or the leader because we think that those guys are awesome and, and have a lot of weight on their shoulders. But if you're not bringing it back to the business outcomes, if you're not bringing it back to what the business needs, aligning that with what the CX is and saying, guys, this is how we can help. Here's how we can drive that business forward. Here's what the data is showing and here's what we should do about it. Then you're just sitting on your bubble saying, hey, we're pretty awesome. You should focus on the customer. That's right. And, and of course, there's not only does this help bring accountability and to demonstrate the ROI of, of customer experience, but it also could provide uh, specific tactical advice that as we understand the difference across the customers and we start asking what kind of CX activities would these customers, these valuable customers want that might not be, you know, super appealing to the entire customer base, but 
that's okay. So the customer-based audit can not only uh, help us assess the CX activities, but can really bring much more precision to them and therefore more effective outcomes next time around. I like it. So the subtitle of the customer's based audit is the first step on the journey to customer centricity. Go buy the book. Um, how do the concepts of the audit analysis sit within the broader concept of customer centricity? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question because on, on one hand, I, I as again, the subtitle says it's the first step, but quite honestly, it's, it's something that, that came say 10 years after I wrote that first book. So I've actually been piecing together uh, the, the, the three books I've written, the two startups I've had, just a, a bunch of the other activities. Uh, and of course, I'll be very happy to share that with you. You can share with the listeners to see how these things fit together. Some of it, I'm the first to admit, is 2020 hindsight. But from that learning, we really understand that it might have come late for me, but it should come early for, for uh, companies that are just getting started with it. And I think this stuff really does fit together well, even if it's been a kind of a haphazard journey for myself to, to identify and piece together uh, all these components. So speaking of getting started, what's the best way for companies to get started and get their house in order? Before we even dive into the lenses, before we even think about how we slice and dice that, that spreadsheet, first, we have to put that spreadsheet together. Uh, and so one thing we haven't discussed, in fact, companies often don't discuss at all, is how do we define the customer? So the rows of our spreadsheet, are they individuals? Are they households uh, in a B2B setting? Is it the procurement officer or is it you know, the entire company? So having a discussion about who is the customer, uh, and we actually uh, devote quite a, a bit of attention to that in the front end of the book, because we, we have to figure that out first before we start uh, pulling all this data together. And then likewise, what's going on on the columns? Is it purely purchasing? Is it maybe visits to the website? Is it referrals? I mean, there's lots of other value generating activities that, that uh, companies and customers are engaged in. And which of those things can we measure? Which of those things should we be tracking and auditing? So there's actually a lot of fundamental questions. And I hate to say it, there aren't easy answers to them, but we need to have that conversation. So as we start to do the audit, we're going to at least agree with the, the basis of, of, of how we assemble the data going into the audit. Peter, what do you mean? We got to build the foundation before we have to build the house. I just don't understand. I think you should add <laughs> windows first and then the foundation. You know, and, and I have to admit, I'm, I'm as guilty as anyone on this because I'll often use a loose definitions of who the customer is. Uh, I'll often for, from one uh, a project to another, I'll use something that might even be a little bit contradictory. Uh, and so just having that, that, that simple conversation about who is the customer. And again, I hope readers are interested. This is actually the very start of the book where we lay out a scenario of, of someone's like uh, in an airport. And anyway, I'm not gonna drag you through the whole thing, but there's a lot of things that, that, that you as a potential customer are doing, a lot of products and services that you're interacting with. And the producers of those products and services see you as a customer for each and every one of them. But in your mind, you actually don't have a relationship. Yeah, I, I gave you money for that backpack, you know, five, 10 years ago. Doesn't mean I'm a customer of yours right now. You know, we had a relationship, it's over, even though I'm still using your backpack. Uh, I, I hope that, that your listeners can imagine that, that in, uh, in many, many cases, when they think that there's a relationship taking place, there might not be. And once again, don't take it personally, <laughs> um, but but do have good clarity on who is a customer, who isn't, and 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 what kinds of measurements we should have around them. I like it. So, what advice do you have for my listeners to go from audit to action? Well, of course, that is the final chapter of the book. Dun, dun, uh, dun. Uh, and, uh, and I have to give just a tremendous amount of credit to uh, well, to both of my co-authors, Bruce Hardy professor at London Business School, who we, he and I have been you know, kind of sharing a brain for, goodness gracious, uh, 30 years now. But our third co-author, Michael Ross, he's a practitioner, uh, co-founded and, and, and runs a, kind of a, a, a data analytics firm over in the UK. He is Mr. Audit to Action. He's actually been doing a lot of this stuff for years. Uh, and it wasn't until recently that we, again, formalized and organized uh, these ideas of, of the audit. And again, the, the guidance to different kinds of actions. 
Uh, and, and again, we could talk for days about it. If you think about the, uh, at the broadest level, what those actions would be, customer acquisition, customer retention, customer development, the different aspects of the audit will be well suited for each of those activities. And then we could take that deeper dive, like when it comes to retention, which customers should we be focusing on? Um, what kinds of outreach will they be most responsive to? Um, what would be the, the ROI on those retention efforts? So there really is a lot to say, and I'll say it again, none of these ideas are new, but using the audit to kind of guide and gauge those activities, to prioritize them, to, to see the, the, the value that we're getting from each one of them, to help figure out when we have this pile of money to spend next year, how we should be allocating it across these activities. Uh, that's where the, the audit and the audit to action connection can be extremely valuable. Got it. I like it. So uh, at the very end, I ask every single guest, um, typically, if you leave a note to all customer service, customer experience professionals, what would it say? I'm going to change it just a little bit. And because you kind of mentioned being the guide, you know, when it comes to customer, ex uh, the customer base audit, let's say somebody f finally reads your book, uh, and they're like, this is great. What do I do next? What what advice to that do you have to guide them to that next step? Well, it, it depends who we're talking to. So if if it's the if it's a high level person who's overseeing the audit, uh, then it's going to be well, you know, do the audit, <laughs> do it carefully, do it thoughtfully, do it regularly, uh, and then spend a lot of time looking over the results and and thinking about how it's going to impact acquisition, retention, development, uh, what kinds of statements you can share with your stakeholders, maybe even starting to put some of these customer metrics in your, in, in the, in the uh, say, uh, auditable statements that, that uh, in a 10Q or something like that. Um, so, uh, so at that level, uh, it, it's, it's all about, you know, thinking about the audit strategically. Mm -hmm. uh, at at uh, other parts of the organization, and again, the way you asked the question is that frontline customer service professional, uh, I think it's, it's a recognition that not all customers are created equal. It's a recognition that a lot of the changes that we're going to see in customers are for reasons that are out of your control, uh, and you can't necessarily change that. Uh, the, the audit gives you both that that uh, that that knowledge as as well as the 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 courage to you know to to change what you can and accept what you can't uh, instead of the kind of um, the idea that through customer service that we can do anything that we can turn any of these ugly duckling customers into beautiful swans if we just you know talk to them long enough or say the right things to them I think it brings a bit of of, of humility. Uh, which I think is, is really valuable in understanding the limits of what customer service and customer experience can do, but also some of the opportunities to do it uh, more effectively. Sounds like sound advice to me. You should really write a book about the ugly duckling and swans. I hear, <laughs> I, I think that could be a great, great kickoff. <laughs> book number 17. Uh, you know, uh, Peter, thanks for your time. Uh, how do my listeners find you or find more information about the book or or your company? Well, I'm not hiding, so they could always just, just Google my name. Um, but I really do encourage folks to to look at, at, at Theta. And I'm not doing this as, as a sales pitch for it, but just there's a lot of really great case studies and just advice about calculating customer lifetime value, fitting it in with, with a, a broader sets of analytical activities. Uh, and, and the idea of starting with finance, you know, getting the CFO on board and pushing this kind of audit thing uh, is, a, is, is a great way to develop that kind of discipline to make sure that it gets done. Uh, and so making sure that they're, they're going to be partners of yours and not just uh, an impediment, as <laughs> all too often we see that from our marketing world. Unfortunately, that is true. So to all my listeners, I will put a link in the show notes, but the customer base audit, the first step on the journey to customer centricity by the book. Uh, start creeping on Peter here on LinkedIn and social media and go check out uh, his business as well. Peter, thanks for your time and uh, wish you nothing but success. And Nick, I really appreciate your excellent questions uh, and just everything you're doing to spread the gospel about this stuff. I think that that everybody, especially your listeners, really benefit from it. It's my pleasure. Thanks again. Bye now.